now Delta. Delta actually pays my pension because we merged back in or, well, about 2010. And when I started with Northwest, I was the fourth woman pilot they hired on, in 1981. So back then, oh, that wow. is what we had to wear, sadly. Oh, right. uh, yeah. Huh. And I guess they wanted us to look as much like the guys as we could. Some of the airlines still do that. But luckily, we switched over to this comfortable ascot look, and it, it made it a lot better to fly. Does anybody know who this is? <laughs> nope. His name is Joe Sutter. He's the head of the engineering team that built the Boeing 747. This is a great book if you haven't read it. And he, he is the nicest guy. He, he passed away a few years ago, but Joe was great. And of course, he knew everything about the airplanes. You could ask him questions. When I started, I started on the 727. And even on the 727, we flew freight. Because Northwest started out as an airmail company. And our bellies were always full of freight. I'll just pass them around if you guys can see them. We had, a lot of times they wanted us to take passengers off to put the mail bags on. That's how important it was. And Northwest knew how to make money with freight. When I started flying the DC-10 next, then we were flying tons of fish. So we'd go to Hawaii, we'd pick up thousands and thousands of pounds of fish and fly it back to the States. Then, finally, in 1990, when I, or 1988, when I moved out to Sherman County, about an hour east of here, I got on the 747. I swore I'd never fly flight engineer again, but I did, because there's no way to live this far out and fly back and forth on, say, four trips a month out in Minneapolis. So I switched my base out here, first to Los Angeles, then to Seattle. And I could get my flights done usually in 10 days a month. The 747s that I flew at first were mostly passenger airplanes, and that's a passenger model. Does anybody know how I can tell looking at it? Exactly. <laughs> so the, the, the only windows on the freighters are up here in the upper deck. It's the three level airplane, and they kept. Some of the freighters they fly people on too. So a lot of times when you're flying freight, you need to have a handler on board for the animals because the animals are this is going to work unless they do it the right way. So the handlers are necessary because when you've got livestock in the back and they start misbehaving, <laughs> the handlers go down and take care of them instead of pilots. And one day the handler is getting chased around by the zebra downstairs and we're thinking, okay, better him than us. <laughs> and he had a hammer and he had nails and he got the thing back in the crate and we were just laughing because we were like, oh my gosh, I bet we just wouldn't have gone downstairs. <laughs> wouldn't have happened. So, so anyway, but, um, I, I thought flying freight was a lot of fun. One of the advantages on the 747 is that when the nose cone goes up, you can load very long pieces of freight. And that's what made it so good for, for so many companies to ship with us. We had race cars, we had boats, we had anything imaginable besides animals and, and coming back from Hong Kong, a lot of clothes. China would always ship just bins and bins and bins of clothes. And you could go through the manifest best in the cockpit and go, oh, more clothes, more clothes, more clothes. But a lot of times we'd also have pigs. Uh, one day we had a pallet of pigs in the back, and I was still a flight engineer. The flight engineer has to walk around and make sure that everything is locked down, that all the bins are locked in place so they don't slide on takeoff. In the early days of freight, uh, they had a lot of accidents because when they lift the nose on takeoff, the animals would break through the whatever barrier they had in there, end up in the back, and the thing would just all over the center of gravity. And, and of course, it didn't just happen on the runway where you could possibly sal 
adopted. A lot of times it was on pine out, and by then it was too late. So, you really want to make sure the bins were locked down. And a lot of times you would find locks, not bins not latched, which would be so dangerous because the weight of one bin cascading into the bin behind could force it loose and break it back. And anyway, I was walking around that one day on the way to Anchorage, and my husband was meeting me there with that little girl. And we had, the, we had these pigs in the back, maybe 12 of them. So I walked around, made sure urine's always leaking out. You never know with freighters. And I got to Anchorage, went to the hotel room. I think I'd been on the airplane maybe three hours. And I went to kiss him good morning, and he goes, oh, you smell like a pig, go take my shower. <laughs> There were three of us. 
guys, and when you when you want to go back and get your dinner or your breakfast or start it in the oven, you just got up, walked back, and did it. You didn't have to wait for that flight attendant to come up and serve you. So we got we got pretty used to the lifestyle. And anybody else have any questions right now before we go any further? So did they have standard power sizes? Yes, very. And as far as I know, they're pretty they're pretty specific. I, I, I'm sure I make the traps to the earth, but the 747 ones were much larger than the DC-10 or the Airbus or, you know, any of the other ones were. And the DC-10 ones were, were a good size. And I, I remember that when I first started flying the 10, one of our guys was killed because the pallet wasn't on the loader right, and it started to come off, and he just reached up like... Oh. I don't know what he was thinking. I mean, it just hit me. And so, most of our stuff is loaded. Actually, the, the nose isn't used that often. It, it's used at first and sometimes at the last. But the back door on the back yeah. on the left side is the one that we use all the time. Mm. So when they when they're loading freight through the front, you can't get up to the cockpit and so if you're in the cockpit, you can't get down. So, kind of locked in there. Question. Yes. What is on the upper level where the cockpit is? Um, so the only thing up there on the freighter is like four seats on ours. Uh -huh. And a closet and some other things. Some of, some of them are, can extend back a little further. But it's really just the cockpit, which has five seats, uh -huh. two extras. Oh. Um, in case it's a check ride or something like that. And then there's a bathroom. Then there's a little galley. Okay. And then, and, and there, on the other planes, on the passenger planes, there are bunks up there. Because we could sleep yeah. when we were double crew. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and on this one, no bunks. No bunks. Right. <laughs> no, no. But yeah. really comfortable first class seats. And well, at least, yeah, and you had gal. Exactly. And you had a, a lot of doors. We had everything we needed. Yeah, and we were locked out of that galley like we are now. Uh, yeah. So, because, you know, now, if you have to go to the bathroom, you have to wait until the flight attendant has a break and you can get up there and let you out. It's yeah. really a hassle. I, I don't know why they haven't put lavatories inside the cockpit. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so unhealthy. Yeah. It's really, it's pretty bad not to drink water for hours. Oh. My son's going to be going now. I will bring this up. Good. You tell him. We need to back up. We're not making ten more ten anymore. And, and the other thing, the reason I'm dressed like this today is, honestly, this is how we dress. You know, we didn't have to wear uniforms. The guys, a lot of times, to get through security, they'd be, we'd be full uniform. Mm -hmm. As soon as we got on board, we'd get on our jeans, or the guys would get on their sweats. Oh. <laughs> and overalls. And whatever we wanted to wear, that was the best part. It oh. was so good. And it was so much fun. Well, how did you get your training? I started in high school in, at the university. Well, I lived in Gainesville, Florida. And I went to the university's laboratory school. So they had like a test class for science. And it was aviation. And I took a field trip, went out to the airport, and absolutely fell in love you know, with the whole, the whole idea of flying. I didn't go up that day because my parents didn't want me to fly. They were like, nope, your money's in the bank, sorry. <laughs> so I went inside, started talking to the, flight, to the receptionist at the front desk, and they told me, why don't you just get a job here on the weekends? We're, we're looking for somebody to hire. You can work two weekends, get a lesson, and you get 20% off. So that's wow. what I did. And then I wore glasses back then. And I was 20, 30. Well, and I had astigmatism, so I couldn't have gone military. You had to be 20, 20 to go military. I really never expected to be able to go into the airlines because I thought, well, I can fly corporate, I could teach flying, there are a lot of things I can do without being an airline pilot. But there was a shortage back in 1980, and they lowered their standards to 2070, <laughs> and all of a sudden, wow. yeah. Well, the other, so, the, I, so I went to college because my parents didn't want me flying and, and had saved, my dad died when I was a little kid, my real dad, so, so she saved all the VA money for my college for me. And I 
when, when my mom didn't want me flying with that money, obviously I respected it because I'm not the one that saved it. So she, she could put whatever limitations on it she wanted. And then when I was almost out of college, I decided, you know, I really like flying. I don't, I, I love studying microbiology and environmental health, but I didn't want to be stuck in a lab. I'd rather be stuck in a cockpit. Uh, I watching a world go by underneath. So I went back to flying, and I, most of my time, well, I pumped gas, and I washed airplanes, and I was a flight attendant for rock groups, and I just kept working on my ratings as I had the money. And I became a flight instructor, and I taught at Troutnick for two years. And then I got hired by the Forest Service in Boise. And I flew for the Forest Service for a fire season, doing the grid work over the fires, the infrared mapping. Mm -hmm. That was all in turboprops, King Airs, and we had a Merlin. Merlin. As, soon as, the, as soon as the airline saw that I had 2,000 hours with 400 of it heavy, what they considered heavy time, then, they, then I got hired. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a while, it took five years to get there, but it was worth every every minute because it was so fun flying to get there. And all of this story is in your book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. It's Thanks, Jean. Jean. Yeah, I'm going to read. I, like, I wasn't going to make, okay, so I wasn't going to write a book because everybody writes a book and <laughs> who cares? And then I read my girlfriend's book. She was a flying tiger pilot. There's even a picture of her in here of her flying in her pajamas, which just cracks me up. <laughs> so, so she said everything that I wanted to say in hers, and I thought, well, I'm really not writing a book. But I talk to kids at schools and, and in prisons and things like that, and it's nice to leave something behind for them to kind of remember you or, or steer them someplace where if they're interested, they can read more. So that's why I wrote the book. I don't think it's ever going to be a bestseller. No, it's fun to read. Yeah, that's good. And lots of pictures, because I did write it for anybody. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, okay, okay. I don't know how many they have in the gift shop, but I just told them I'll just donate part of, you know, yeah, whatever. Oh, good, okay. Okay, so, and I can put those in there, too. But, and the other, I thought I'd have, oh, oh, here's the other thing, if you guys, so these are, these are my, my airplane cards, and the reason that I started making these was also for the kids, because it's got all the specs on the back for the Boeing 747. <laughs> so, it, you know, it tells you how how long and how tall and how much fuel and how heavy. So grab as many cards as you want. And then I, I brought these because we, we carry everything from Brahma bulls to zebras to giraffes, wow. giraffe giraffes. horses, cows, everything. Race horses? Actually, hmm, yes, but mostly we were carrying draft horses back when I was alive. Oh, okay. And they were buying them up in Washington and they take them down in weight. They skinny them up. Oh. Take them overseas, fatten them up again, and the Japanese love horse meat. Oh, that's yeah. it, you know, flying isn't always pretty. Because <laughs> those horses, I mean, you look back there and they're just beautiful, beautiful animals, and and uh, you knew like they were going to, you knew their fate, so you didn't want to get too attached to them. <laughs> One time, oh, this, so this is my girlfriend, Jean, captain. Obviously, I was co-pilot. You can tell I didn't have my tie fixed. And Jeff thought he'd died and gone to heaven. He was our best engineer. We had the best, we had the best layovers for, for a 10-day trip. But he was happy. He was. We, we, we would fly from Anchorage or Seattle, like I, I think this was a Seattle trip, over to Tokyo. And then we would have a week of flying back and forth to Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taipei, you name it, Manila, all over the, all over Asia. And we had pretty long layovers. That was the other thing about our freight. I think that flying tiger, not flying tiger, um, UPS, FedEx, and Atlas right now are the main freight carriers in our country. And the problem they're having is the FAA doesn't regulate them as much as they do the passenger pilots. Oh. So they don't get the same amount of sleep, and they don't have the same um, level of safety, if you want to call it that. And I don't understand why, because it's 
since I was with a carrier that flew people and freight, all of my duty regs were the same as if I had just been a straight freight pilot. So we didn't have short 10-hour nights. We didn't have, you're flying on the backside of the clock over in Asia. And even in, even in this country, a lot of times they're flying at night. So it, it just isn't, it doesn't make sense to me to not give them as much rest as we get as regular pilots. I, I just don't understand what's keeping the FAA from, from ruling that way. But so far, we haven't had luck getting, getting the same laws for, for freight dogs or the same respect. Which is, which is sad, too, because just some of the crashes that you've heard about lately, like Amazon Prime mm -hmm. flight, it, it just didn't get the impact that if a, if a, if a plane well, had gone down with people on it. It's like, oh, well, just three people and they were just right. pilots. Right. Uh -huh. So that's, that's just one of the things that's frustrating with me. This doesn't look as big as it is, but when, you, when you're out there looking up at it, it's, it's huge. Huge. But there's a reason they call them the whales. <laughs> and we don't power back. You know, a lot of planes will they'll do reverse thrust to, to get out of the parking spot. We don't do that. This doesn't. It's, well, it's not smart, number one, because there's a lot of stuff on a freight ramp. And it it's just doesn't make sense. And I don't think a 747, I've never seen one power back. This is a, this is not a 74, this is a, probably an Airbus. I've got some pictures that a friend of mine gave me. This is, this is washing our window, and we can't even joke with these guys. The windows on the other planes that I flew, like 727, DC-10, um, Actually, I shouldn't say that about the DC-10. 727, I remember, we'd open the window, slide it out, and go, you want my credit card? Choke <laughs> <laughs> around with them. So these are, this is that app door again. And we, we, the guys would tell people, when they were out drinking in various towns, they'd say, what do you do for a living? And they, they didn't want to tell anybody they were pilots, so they'd say, oh, I drive an 18-wheeler. And it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, there are 18 wheels on that airplane. <laughs> I couldn't say that. Because then they go, really? You drive a big truck? <laughs> no, not really. That's one of the pictures that looks really good on the screen and really bad there. A lot of times when you're taking off and you're in Los Angeles or Anchorage and the runway length isn't that much excess of what you've got. They, they weigh all these pallets, and they weigh, you know, you basically know what your airplane weighs and what you have on board with fuel. But as you're getting towards the end of the runway, and you start to come back on the stick, on the yoke, and the airplane doesn't feel like it's going to fly, all of a sudden you're going, oh shit. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Just push power up a little bit more because you don't want to over, over uh, rev the engines. But it ain't there. All of a sudden, that 55,000 pounds of thrust in each engine just doesn't seem like quite enough. And there would be times that we would be joking around and we would just start rocking back in the seats, you know. And then we'd, and then we'd take off, and as we're going out of LA, we would just be the, the captain or somebody would make a smart out comment like, Man, I hope we didn't take out that barrier at the end of the runway. I didn't feel anything. So, so takeoffs are pretty, they, they're very, there's a lot more to a takeoff than people think. Because when you lose an outboard engine on a plane like this, oh. at 836,000 pounds, and that all of a sudden it's coming around on you, it, it takes some real quick flying and good skills to keep it straight and to keep it climbing and get the flaps up, the air flaps up. So when you hear people talking about, oh, what's more dangerous, take off or landing? Honestly, it is the takeoff. You're heavier, you got more fuel, and and you've got a lot more torque. This is again, I, I think this is probably an Airbus because some of the pictures are mixed in. Maybe not. 
sense I'm crazy, 23 degrees of crap. Yeah, that's and it would straighten itself out. So it, it might be. They must have to And the one thing that they, ta that they taught you when you were learning how to fly this airplane is, whatever you do, just don't start walking the roads. And you're still, you're still way up in the air when the back wheels are down. You're still 20 feet up. Huh. Don't quit flying it just because you've got the mains on the ground. You, it is still a flying airplane. So you, it was it was just one of those, I, I don't know, I, I love the plane. I, I wish I had one in my backyard on the ranch. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. The, uh, the thing I don't understand about the, the Airbus 380 is that they didn't make the center gear so that it was steerable. So they have to go all the way to the end of the runway, take huge, long, you know, to wide turns. The 747 had been out for years when they made that A380, but they just think it was unnecessary because because if you've got if you want to turn off a runway and you want to make a, a decent 90 degree turn, that that gear, the the trucks in the middle, have got to be able to turn to help you pivot. So. I don't know, I think they missed some big mistakes. I never, I'm sorry, I have so many plane pictures, I just don't get tired of looking at airplanes. So, yeah. This is, this is our runway at Anchorage, although most of the time it seems like I need a six. Flying, to, flying over to Asia from Anchorage is amazing. If you had really strong headwinds, a lot of times they would put you over Russia. But it had to make a more of a difference than an hour in flight time because Russia charges $8,000 to fly over their airspace. And if it wasn't going to save you that much money, you didn't want to... The plane burned 25,000 pounds an hour on an average. So when we did get to fly over Russia, the volcanoes were amazing. I mean, that just doesn't look like Mount Hood. And Camp Chapman with Peninsula on a clear day was incredible. And I think I saw it probably five times in 17 years because most of the time it's fogged over. What, what's that? Is that Benali? No, that's Russia. That's like Cam Chapman. I mean, that's, that's, and the cliffs, like when you fly over Russia, it just drops straight into the sea. It's, it's really, it's really fun. So we're always happy when we've got booted. This is one of the pictures that looks great on the computer. It looks like a dirty cloud sky leaves. <laughs> anyway, this this is a DC-10 crew. They flew into, they're all my girlfriends, so they flew into Osaka and then the first um, flight in of all women. Oh, wow. And Northwest thought it was going to be a great boon for them to advertise. Well, their bookings dropped so much after this flight on the news and they all switched over to JAL and quit flying with us for a while so I think the airline decided well maybe that wasn't the right place to make a publicity stunt <laughs> but like I said a DC-10 we fly well a lot of the planes even 747 we fly into Saipan we pick up 60,000 pounds of fish on a passenger plane Wow. so you never know what you have underneath you when you're on a, on a plane my girlfriend Eileen flies for Atlas, that's her family, I'm co-pilot, and then my girlfriend Shannon flies for, let's see, she's UPS, and the only reason I put these pictures in is these are the newer ones, these are the 400s, so they're two pilot airplanes, that's the old one, here's the new, they're all glass, see my cockpit doesn't have the glass instruments in it. Oh, mine was all, well, I guess you came in at buttons and knobs. Yes, old, old style. <laughs> oh, this is my crew in Hong Kong. This is the night before we were going to be fired. <laughs> so we thought this was our last trip into Hong Kong. We really, really did. They, uh, they had a freighter that they were converting over from Singapore to ours. Only Singapore had three autopilots. We only had two. So they had to do a lot of a lot of um, switching to get things to work. Well, we showed up and they still didn't have it working right. 
and they were past schedule by two weeks, and if we didn't fly it out that day, they weren't going to get their bonus. And we were like, oh, sorry. I, I, we're not flying it if it's not ready. So the first thing I did was start pre flighting the cockpit, and the radio altimeter that tells me distance off the ground just would just spin. And I, I showed the captain, and I said, Les, look at this. And he goes, that's not right. <laughs> I asked the techs who were flying with us on the way back, and they said, oh, well, we couldn't get the 747 altimeter to work, so we had to put a DC-9 radio altimeter in. Oh. Are you freaking kidding me? Really? There's, that takes paperwork, and it's not here. Well, we'll get it to you by Anchorage, they said. They said, we're, no, we are flying from Hong Kong, I mean, from, from uh, let's see where we're, Hong Kong to Osaka. So that's like a two-hour flight now. I, we said, no, you know, no, we need paperwork before we go. So they were trying to figure that one out. And then one of the guys slipped up and said, well, actually, last week on a test flight, we had flames coming out from the instrument panel. So we haven't had time to do another test flight yet, but we think it'll be okay. Oh, we, just, we just said, no, we're done. We are done. We're not flying this plane. Forget it. And, and it was the worst air pollution day ever in Hong Kong, and hot, over 100 degrees. And so we went back to the hotel. We didn't realize how mad they were at us. The tech ops guys were not, their bonus was going to be a substantial bonus, like 25 grand a piece. They called Minneapolis and told them we turned the airplane down to go drinking in Hong Kong. Oh, and you can see we did. <laughs> One of those deals, we didn't know how bad it was until the next day when our flight was canceled. We called up to find out what we were doing, and crew scheduling said, oh, well, you, you were supposed to be on that flight to Narita this morning, the passenger flight there. And I said, you're kidding. And she, they didn't know why, so I called my girlfriend in Minneapolis, and she said, Kathy, they're going to fire you. They've got lawyers and court reporters already. You're going through Seattle to get lectured by the chief pilot there, and then you're going out to Minneapolis, and they're, they're going to fire you. And I was like, hmm, I'm reporting for, you know, not flying an airplane that wasn't safe. Well, there you go. Right. That's, well, luckily, luckily, by the time we got to, through some more rigmarole, by the time we got to Minneapolis, they decided maybe they wouldn't fire us, maybe they'd just reprimand us. And they wouldn't listen to us. They hadn't read our air safety report or anything. So we couldn't get anybody to just pay attention. And the, the VP of Flight Ops was screaming at us in this room, you know, I can't believe a flight crew of your seniority and your hours would do something like this. What the hell's wrong with you? And, and uh, the captain had read that he said, well, did you read our air safety report? No, I know what happened. I was told. And so the captain started reading it to him. And the guy just, you could tell, he just, he wasn't even listening. He was so mad. And so, so he, the last finished, and he said, do you have anything to add to me? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He goes, what? And I said, well, first of all, you haven't heard about the flames coming out from behind the instrument panel yet. And, and then I told him about the, the altimeter and everything else that we found wrong. And he cooled down a little bit, and he sent us, sent us off, or made his decision, brought us back, and apologized, kind of, and said, call me at home next time, whatever, but do not ever turn down an airplane without you know, getting proper permission. And, and he's still yelling at us. And I said, he said, this is a perfectly good airplane that's been flying around for a week now. And I said, well, your perfectly good airplane still has three outstanding items on it. Because I had a friend in engineering, and he'd, he'd, he'd give me copies of it. And the guy looked, the VP looked at the, the manuals and revision man in the room with him, and the guy goes, and he, he goes, that's it. He goes, you guys are going home first class. There's going to be nothing in your file. You can check the secret file, too. And, you know, and we're, we're, we're pulling everything. You know, no, no reprimand. But it was just one of those nightmares we couldn't get out of. So, yeah, anyway. We didn't get fired. We didn't. No. Actually, he, he finally realized we did the right thing. But, but you know what the, the complaints 
it's not ready to fly, it's not ready to fly. If we had passengers on that plane, we would have taken it. We wouldn't have taken it. Yeah, we wouldn't have taken it. But I'm just saying, if it was a passenger plane, I mean, they would have, they would have not probably insisted you go ahead and fly it. Um, Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a disconnect sometimes between pilots and management, and they just don't understand. So, I wish. Yeah. Well, I wish. Yeah. This is, there are pink dolphins in Hong Kong Harbor. So I was out on the pink dolphin tour that day, and the planes were taking off over for me. It was, it was awesome. It was, I loved Hong Kong. The, one of the best things about Hong Kong coming into the old airport in Kowloon. Have you all heard about that airport? I hear the coach is really, really gnarly going It was. It yeah. was. You're flying towards the checkerboard in bad weather. And basically, it's just a big billboard that's orange and white checkered. And so you fly into it, and then you turn, and you're between these two hills with high-rise apartments on either side. And the runway's got water at the other end, and it's very short. So you have to be right on, again, right on your game. And the, I'll, I'll flip through these really fast. So this is the old, the old style cockpit. And you'll see Hong Kong pictures in a minute. These planes aren't, it looks like a lot of dials and switches, but as most of you know, when there's four of everything, you're just looking for sameness. It makes it a lot easier. And it's not nearly, you know, it's not nearly as hard to look at when all the gauges are supposed to be basically in the same position for all four engines. You don't want to drink and fly. That's what I, <laughs> I found this in a hangar party in Texas and I couldn't resist. So. <laughs> Another girlfriend, she was flying cat building 400, you can tell again by the, by the instruments. And there's the one I flew, and you can tell again by the instruments. And mine were pretty primitive compared to hers. So, do, have any of you gone on airliners.net? Have you ever heard of that? It's a great site for photos. So I'm going to zip ahead. That was when we first start my mail. Zipping ahead to Hong, to Hong Kong pictures. Okay. Airliners.net has got these great photos of the old Calhoun Airport. These guys, you, you've got to land within the first thousand feet of the runway. If you're even, if you're anything over 100 feet high, you're going to go off the other end. You're not going to get it stopped. So, for somebody to be that, that out of position, at that point is landing. I, I, you know, that's a definite goal around. <laughs> that guy should have gone around. Because he just caught the outside of the engine. This guy should have gone around. And this is this is it. This is an optical illusion, so you gotta get it get get out of it. Singapore is a, a good airline. China Air is not. China, China Air is not one that we are we there's certain people we would get head on and their safety reputation was just dismal back then, and I don't think it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to check, before you go on a lot of these flights, check the airline, check their pack, check where they're at in the standing safety-wise, because he went off the end of the runway, <laughs> into, the, into the tree. And then, this, I think I just threw this in kind of for fun. You know what staff have been holding in Japan one day? Did everybody see Sully? Did you guys all see the Sully movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I couldn't figure out why the, why the, it looked kind of fake to me. I liked the movie, but I didn't like the scenarios when you were looking at the bottom of the plane and it was coming down. It was too clean. They should have roughed it up. <laughs> That's what airplanes look like underneath. They are never, never clean. So I think they kind of used a model and they never, they didn't about simulating the dirt and the grease and the oil and the yeah. fuel. Uh, so my, my girlfriend did the walk around, the one that was in the captain's seat back the ways. She, she did her first walk around the 727, and she came back to the cockpit, and she told the captain that she thought he had a hydraulic leak. And he said, 
Xanthop was another one. Yeah, yep. Xanthop. Yep, and Evergreen. Yeah, and Evergreen. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one, yeah. In 19, right around 1990, I want to say, I don't, know, I don't remember the year exactly, but we, there were 10 of us freighters in Anchorage who took off. And they called us the French fry flights. We were loaded to the gills. We each had 250,000 pounds of McDonald's fries. And they quick <laughs> Okay. 